Hey guys, Sandra, welcome back to the channel. So guys, this is going to be a We Need to Talk series as well. And so guys, recently I've received a bit of pushback from one of the shorts I put up. And it's an interesting reminder to me that actions have consequences. Um, this is something where I'm going to start taking a step back from the channel a bit more. I'm not going to completely shut it down or anything like that, but I've got a blog post explaining why and what happened with that short. But it shows me, it proves the point that people who are higher functioning with disabilities receive a lot more criticism from people who are much more dependent, whether that be physically or emotionally or don't have the mental capacity to understand their reactions. And so guys, I'm going to do a deep dive, and this is going to be the start of the series, on disability and relationships. So there's a couple of different relationships that we go through. Obviously your family relationships, you can have healthy families and unhealthy families. So I won't go into that because I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a family worker. But generally, just as a brief overview, healthy families, you feel safe, you're secure, your basic needs are met physically, financially and emotionally. You're pushed to have an education uh, to then achieve what you're capable of, whether that be a job in the sheltered workplace, whether that be a job with um in the open market, whether that be going on to further study, whether that be running a micro business, whatever it might be. Then there's also, depending on where you live, your life stage, there might be support workers, there might be caregivers, there might be house parents, there might be teachers, there might be life skills advocates, there might be support coordinators. Then one thing that we really, really need to talk about is friendship and disability. Um, I've found that I've always found friendships hard. And it's because there's been a couple of factors. So it could be I didn't understand what I was doing would annoy people, rub them off the wrong way. I was either working, so when everyone else was dating, getting married, I didn't have those opportunities to do so. Then um, we also see that as soon as you disclose to someone that you have a disability, whether that be physical, emotional, people actively de-incentivize or they try to care for you. I know that there are couples who have been both able-bodied and through accident, illness or injury, one person becomes disabled. A completely different ball game. They're in a committed relationship. They've said for better, for worse, whether that be in front of a church, priest, person or just by their actions. But I'm talking about dating and forming relationships with a disability. Um, this is something that we need to talk about a lot more because if we are not talking and actively talking about relationships and respect, so I'm talking about respecting what your family wants for you because oftentimes they can see things that you're doing that are putting you at risk that aren't appropriate, that could be a privacy issue, that could be cause backlash, that could cause you emotional harm or physical harm. There might be support workers in your life and so knowing their boundaries, letting them finish on time, not unnecessarily burdening them, but if you find you're veering over into the friendship stage, respecting the rules of not working with them for, I think it is agency dependent, but it could be two years to six months and then getting back in contact because the relationship will fundamentally change being on a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And then we also do have 
something that's coming through that I wanted to investigate a bit more called peer mentoring and a disability doula. So that's someone who might be a trained support coordinator or a trained administrator who is able to guide you through the process of getting approved for a disability support pension for getting your approved for NDIS or other care. Um, that's generally the role of a support coordinator within the NDIS and it is a paid role. Not sure if they have in Australia, so drop it in the comments below if they do. And then they've got one around romantic and dating relationships. Um, obviously, we have the standard heterosexual relationships, then we also have same-sex relationships as well. Um, I believe that if you have the ability to consent, ability to understand the relationships, you shouldn't be hamstrung from having these relationships. There might need to be extra guidance um, taught around it. And this is where we need to have difficult and challenging conversations around consent. So I do know 1-800-RESPECT, Protea Place, um, there's some great websites, talk about respect. So I know Psychology Today, talk about respect. I know that there's some great Facebook groups that talk about disability and relationships um, as well. This is a really hard one to talk about with consent because we see that disability and consent, consent is handled a little bit differently as well. So you have assumed consent, so that's a support worker helping you with medication management, with breakfast, lunch, dinner, you might be helping them you with housework it might be checking on you doing bed checks making sure you've got your CPAP on it might be checking that you've got uniforms for whatever you volunteer with workplaces study is done homework is done assignments are done it might also be checking in with family and friends and so Obviously, there are levels of consent. So you've got the assumed consent, which is the everyday things where you're accepting the help. Then you have written consent. So that's written consent of what the support worker can and can't do for you, what um, you're responsible for at work, where you are signing confidentiality agreements. So it can be a breach of trust or privacy if you're sharing that information with others without the other's written consent. Um, I know that plays a big role in what I say over on the blog, on the YouTube here as well. And that's why when I'm talking about very specific situations, I either post it on the Patreon or don't post it at all or fictionalise the story. Then we have enthusiastic consent. Uh, this is more around friendship and relationships as well. So I'm talking friendships where it might be a bit challenging, it might be that you're doing something to keep the friendship and you're not sure of it. And this is where I'd encourage you to talk to family, friends, support workers, a psychologist, a counsellor, to see whether it is a healthy friendship or if it's a codependent relationship or even a trauma bond. Um, knowing what is a healthy relationship can be challenging for people with a disability as well. Um, it has come out in the Royal Commission that people with a disability are more likely to experience abuse, neglect and exploitation as well. Um, that's something I'm following very closely, but there are some more established disability advocates who are doing much better work than I could ever do on that one. So if you go and check them out as well. But then let's get into the meat of the video, which is enthusiastic consent. So enthusiastic consent is around generally romantic relationships when they're starting to get physical. Um, this is where we need to talk about 
good touching, bad touching, uh, your body clothes. So I will be referring to these with the childlike thing because it's the easiest point of reference for some people with a disability. So your body clothes are good touch and your bad touch. Does the touch make you feel safe? Does it make you feel secure? Have you invited it? Have you consented to it? And I know that we're changing the conversation around forcing children to give hugs and saying no if they don't like grandma giving them a hug, if they don't like uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so giving them a hug, respecting their personal autonomy and boundaries. Then if they have the capacity to have a relationship, having sitting down, having that awkward conversation around them about what boundaries are appropriate, what is appropriate for if they're in a cell or disability services accommodation, then the really tricky ones to navigate, and this requires a serious conversation with family, friends, carers as well, is around not keeping secrets. So there are some things that are not your time and place to tell, but not keeping secrets of who they're going out with, who they're spending money with, who they're handing money over with, who they're financially supporting. That can become a abuse and exploitation issue as well. But we do know that people with disabilities are capable of much more than we give them credit for. So this is where we need to start talking about them being on birth control and understanding that they're on birth control, um, allowing them to have protection from, let's be real, honest, sexually transmitted diseases, because they need to be able to experience romantic relationships and physicality like the rest of us do as well. So that's teaching them about privacy, good and bad privacy, keeping secrets, active communication and active consent. And so active consent is something that we're being taught a lot more about. So that's simply yes being yes, no being no, and that you can remove your consent at any time, especially when you're getting physical with someone, let's put it that way. And explaining to them that relationships aren't what they see in movies, TV, and using movies and TVs to teach them about good and bad relationships, um, the reality of having a physical relationship with someone, and how it's not all just physical, and what your values are, and that's a lot more than that as well. And guys, this is something that I'm going to be talking about a little bit more as well. And because I've found that when I go a deep dive looking for resources around this, there's surprisingly very little. So guys, I will be focusing on creating those resources. So over on the blog, doing some more videos about it as well. So I'll be sticking to safe topics. My reasoning is over on the blog as well. So guys, if you're learning things about disability and the issues that we face, because some of the issues that we face are challenging, are difficult, can make people angry, can make people upset, can make people who are recording these videos come off self-entitled. But there is some challenges that we face that are uniquely in the, within the disability community. Um, yes, we are going to make mistakes, but we need to be allowed to make those mistakes because that's when we're going to lash out, become self-entitled, become depressed because we're not allowed the freedom within our capabilities to make the to make mistakes. And this is where dignity of risk comes in and I will be doing a deep dive on dignity of risk versus duty of care as well. So guys this video I will put some trigger warnings on it 
as well. And so guys, if you can, please like, share, subscribe, comment. And that's also why I haven't been doing as many shorts.